As we enter the double digits for the comic, at this point I'm feeling antsy. I thoroughly admit that up to this point I'd experienced most of these comics for myself well after the fact. Way back when, I only started reading the comic around this issue. So yeah, this issue was actually pretty special to me as my very first introduction into the world of not only Sonic comics, but also comics in general. Does that mean I'm going to go easy on it because of my nostalgia goggles? Hell no! Issue 10 has a pretty nice cover, mostly due to the fact that it actually looks like a complete scene, with Robotnik and Crab Meat holding up a large picture frame, a frozen Sonic caught right in front of it. I do like the little touches on this cover, like the loop-de-loop -loop in the background with an extra life monitor on top of it. It's bright, colorful, and indicative of the game it's based off of. Point to the comic. We open up on our first story, Revenge of the Nerbs. Oh god, memories are just flooding back with this one, and not the good kind either. Anyway, our opening scene is Sonic dashing along a minefield, setting off every one he runs across. Rotor begins digging, searching for an electrical wire in hopes of deactivating the power to Robotropolis. While he does manage to find a few, he's not sure which one to break, and when he does break one, it activates a giant energy net around them. Wait, breaking an electrical wire's connection caused the spontaneous manifestation of a giant web of energy. Well, forget all that solar power shit, we should have our scientists working on that. Ow, even a sonic spin won't get through this. Yeah, especially when you look like you're about to keel over from boredom, Sonic. An army of SWAT bots approaches to take our heroes into custody, but when all looks lost, a strange green creature pops out of the ground. I'm a nerb. Not that it's any of your business. I think I hate this character already. Well, whatever the case, the Freedom Fighters use the tunnel the nerb has created to get down under the ground and escape their prison. The nerb continues to be annoying and antisocial. Once we meet the king of the nerbs, we learn the main character trait of the entire species. They're made up of nothing but xenophobic dinkweeds. We nerds have lived in peace for centuries underground on the planet Mobius, and mixing with outsiders can only lead to trouble, not to mention athlete's foot. Well, it turns out that the nerbs, while not the most social of people to begin with, are a little more ticked off than usual, as someone's been messing with their lifelines, threatening their tunnels and water supply with reckless digging. The Freedom Fighters realize it's probably Robotnik that's causing these problems, and try to explain that to the nerbs, saying Robotnik would do anything for cheap real estate. Why don't we join forces? Together, I'm sure we can find a way to stop Robotnik once and for all. This goes about as well as you'd expect. Nerbs mix with outsiders? Never! Well, screw you too, buddy. Despite being offered an escort back to the surface, Sonic and friends decide to show themselves out, just as tired of these unpleasant characters as the audience is. Our heroes begin to trek through the needlessly complex and rather implausible tunnels under Mobius until they come across a large metal door labeled MSS. What does that stand for? Well, if the raunchy smell didn't tip you off, Sonic helpfully informs us that it stands for the Mobian Sewer System. Of course, even when it's not the video game's proper, there always has to be a sewer level, right? They hear the sound of clanking, creaking, and cries of help, and Sonic zooms off to investigate, insisting that the others wait where they are. At the other end of the tunnel, Sonic finds Dr. Robotnik driving an excavation robot, tearing the underground apart, just because he can. I'm not kidding, he even says as much to himself. Haha, <laughs> I love this toy. It's so destructive. Sonic also notices that Robotniks managed to capture three of the nerbs in an energy field similar to the one he was trapped in at the start of the story. Let us out of here, but don't talk to us. Well, aren't you just a peach? Unfortunately, Robotnik has noticed Sonic and begins taking shots at him with a large drill. Sonic uses this to his advantage, positioning himself between the force field and the drill. Try to get me. I'll stand perfectly still. Not. Oh! The impact of the drill causes the force field to deactivate, but instead of being grateful, the nerbs are very quick to identify Sonic as an outsider and refuse to even allow him to save them. Sonic, being the upright citizen that he is, saves them anyway, even though it's a waste of his talents. Good on you, Sonic. I'd have let them get squished by the giant drill. Might even laugh as it happened. 
Sonic drops the NURBS off with his friends, telling them to head back and warn the rest of the NURBS of Robotnik's presence before turning back and dashing down the tunnels, looking for something. And he finds it, the Mobius River. What a river is doing underground behind a closed door isn't really something I'm up for discussing right now, but please feel free to leave your theories in the comments. I do admit the sign next to the river door does get me to grin a little bit. Danger! Do not open doors without permission of Mobius Sewer Authority, and some life insurance. Sonic ignores the sign, busting it open, and quickly runs to try and stay ahead of the river. Also, hi Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles! Sonic tunnels his way back to the surface just in time to see a massive geyser caused by the river to lift Robotnik's entire factory off of the ground. Robotnik himself is quickly expelled from the Earth as well. And so the story ends with Sonic and friends being made honorary NURBS, a fate which causes all of them great distress, except for Rotor, who looks strangely complacent through the entire thing. Well, give me a hit of whatever he's smoking. This story is just annoying, and it's mostly just down to the NURBS themselves. I'd actually be willing to call this an average level story if it weren't for these guys. I mean, the xenophobic race of cave dwellers isn't exactly an uncommon trope, and it can be done well. In fact, it was done pretty well in the Saturday Morning Cartoon Show, which had a very similar plot, but was taken much more seriously and treated much more dramatically. Here, the NURBS just make it stupid and inane. Anyway, moving on to the second story, we come to Twan in the Wind. We open with the Freedom Fighters floating over Mobius in a hot air balloon that was apparently developed by Antoine, looking for a spot for a picnic. Well, I don't know about you, but whenever I go to a picnic, I'm a big fan of surveying my surroundings from above, too. He states that it will probably be a big help to them in the future. Yes, because when I think useful aerodynamic items, the first thing that comes to mind is a slow-moving, easily spotted, easily punctured lump of hot air. And before any balloonists in the audience attempt to question me on any of those statements, I would just like to point out that I am immediately proven right as two buzz bombers spot the balloon, fly up to the top where the Freedom Fighters can't see their approach, and immediately puncture it, causing the Freedom Fighters to plummet to the ground like so many dropped stones. Luckily, they're caught by an outstretched tree branch that seems perfectly tailored to catch their basket. However, these buzz bombers don't seem intent on capturing or killing our heroes, they just pop the balloon to ruin their day. The Freedom Fighters all gang up on Antoine for wasting his time making a balloon in a world full of high-tech robots, making me wonder where all these complaints were at the start of the story. Seriously, the only one in the balloon who seemed to question the logic of being in the hot air balloon was Bunny, who merely asked if the thing was safe. And that's about it. I know that Antoine's the butt monkey of the group, but it's not like this is justified like it was back in Pseudo-Sonic. They're really just blaming him because he was the one who suggested it, and they're all embarrassed that they went along with it. Antoine says that he will never give up on the balloon, no matter how silly or impractical it is. Well, if nothing else, I can admire his tenacity. We cut to Robotnik's lab, which is really starting to look a bit more high-tech compared to the offices we've seen in the past. The Buzz Bombers are being berated for not attempting to capture the Freedom Fighters, as I pointed out earlier, and when Robotnik asks what the Freedom Fighters were up to, we get a quick pun about height before Snively uses the Freedom Fighter Fact Finder, really, to discern that they're having a picnic. Robotnik decides that maybe this is something they should be going to. And we cut back to the Freedom Fighters, where Tails comes across a sulking Antoine. He's ashamed because of the whole balloon thing, and Tails does his best to cheer him up. Well, at least you let us down in a nice tree. You're not very good at this, are you, Tails? However, Antoine decides to give the balloon one last try, and prove that both it and him are not useless. Meanwhile, the Freedom Fighters are sitting down for their picnic, having a grand old time when suddenly, BAM! Robotnik Army Invasion! Sonic is incapacitated by, I kid you not, a bowl of mashed potatoes, and so it looks like our heroes are really up the brown creek without a paddle. But wait, up in the sky, what's that? It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Nah, that'd be a lawsuit waiting to happen. It's actually Antoine in his hot air balloon yet again. The two Buzz Bombers flutter up toward him, stating that they're going to pop the balloon again, but take a moment to taunt him, giving him ample time to, right in front of them, grab a bucket of mud, tossing it at the two of them, causing them to fall to the ground and break apart. 
Antoine proceeds to save the other Freedom Fighters by dropping bags of explosives on Robotnik's army. The SWAT bots are apparently frightened by this and turn tail and run. Your robot conquerors, everyone. Antoine concludes his attack by somehow managing to swoop down on Robotnik, pick him up by the cape, and drop him into a nearby lake while the other Freedom Fighters sing his praises. And so our comic ends with the Freedom Fighters once again floating through the air in a hot air balloon while Tails states that their burner isn't working. Chill out, Tails. As long as Antoine keeps talking, we'll never run out of hot air. Oh, come on, you've all laughed at worse. This issue is, once again, a great big meh. It's definitely better than the last issue, by a long shot, but it just doesn't hold the interest very much. And the flaws that the story have, while few, are very glaring. The first story has the problem of introducing us to an entire race of unpleasant jerks. The NURBS, while this is the only time we'll be seeing them for quite a long time, are basically to Sonic what the Piantas are to Mario in Super Mario Sunshine. It's a race of close-minded, annoying jerks who are blind to the reality of the world around them. The Piantas at least had appealing designs, and not all of them were total jerks. The NURBS are made to look unappealing, sound unappealing, and act unappealing. Heck, this even extends to the end of the story after Sonic saved their entire society from being buried. Instead of accepting the outsiders and maybe re-examining their ideas about relations with other cultures, they indoctrinate Sonic and friends into their society instead. Here's a tip for all you writers out there. If a character, or race in this case, is designed to be annoying, unappealing, or unpleasant to the other characters, chances are good they'll also be all of those things to your audience, and that is not good. I realize that I'm focusing a lot of my criticism on the nerves, but that really is the biggest point of contention for that story. If they weren't there, if their race were a little toned down, a little more accepting, the story might have been a whole lot better. Not amazing, maybe just average, but the nerves do drive it down quite a bit. Once again, the second story is far, far better. Again, not amazing, but definitely better. I do like the fact that it gives Antoine a chance to actually be more than just a comic relief character, which is something that even the TV show didn't do. I'm conflicted with this story otherwise, however. Yes, the hot air balloon is stupid, and the idea that he would be able to defeat Robotnik and his army so easily with one goes beyond suspension of disbelief. Yet, I also think that it's wildly out of character for the other Freedom Fighters to just start heavily criticizing him for the hot air balloon stuff when before they hadn't shown any sort of ill will towards the idea. Also, Sonic getting incapacitated by a bowl of potatoes is stupid. So all in all, I'm forced to once again give an issue a tentative middle-of-the-road rating. It's a step up from last time for sure, but the glaring flaws really stick out in these stories. I'll praise it for giving another character a chance to be the hero besides Sonic, but I can't say I'm sorry to see the nerves fade into obscurity for over a hundred issues. Issue 11 is up next, and... Actually, you know what? After 10 issues of this, I think maybe we need a break from Sonic. Next comic review, we're going to take a look at another well-known icon of video games. See you there, everyone. Now, there's too much escape. Now, there he goes. He looked to the distance and cried.